Oh baby, buzzwords incoming. Today we are talking about automation. And let's draw our little assembly line here. And we've got our little robot guys. Yep, there's one, there's another, and here's a box. All right, now much as I love playing buzzword bingo, let's talk about what automation can do for us in the scope of malware analysis. So, so automation. Uh, in prep to write this course, I watched a whole bunch of videos, and one video that sticks out to me is a video by Malware Unicorn, Amanda Rousseau. If you don't know who Malware Unicorn is, she is absolutely amazing. She does brilliant, brilliant work in the field of RE and does a lot of conference talks, so go check her work out. Go follow her on Twitter. But in any case, at her ShellCon talk in 2017... Uh, Malware Unicorn said that as a malware analyst, she would routinely analyze up to 50,000 malware samples in a day. All right, so let's do some quick maths here. So let's do 24 hours in a day times 60 minutes in an hour. And that's about how many minutes you have in a day. And then we will do 50,000 divided by that number. And so roughly speaking, you are looking at 34 samples per minute if that is every single minute of the day. And so that's not even accounting for the time off, time doing other things like drinking coffee or something like that. So to do 50,000 samples in a day is absolutely astonishing. And so one of the only things you can surmise from that is that automation is an absolute necessity in this field for the initial stages of triage. Now, in partnership with my good friend M.T. Taggart, we have created a seedling project at the time of writing this and recording this video called Blue Jupiter. And so what I want to introduce is the concept of using Jupyter Notebooks for the automation of malware analysis. Now, this is a project in its infancy, and if we go over to the forks of this, I have my own fork. And what we'll be using in this course is the PMATLAB branch of this fork, just so that I can keep the code nice and consistent. All right, so what does Blue Jupyter do? So if you've never used Jupyter Notebooks before, think of Jupyter Notebooks as a way to package your documentation written in Markdown as well as your code together. So you can use Jupyter Notebooks to build pipelines of workflows, right? And there will be code on the back end that can interface with the forward-facing Jupyter Notebook on the front end. And so what you get is nice, clean documentation along with the code itself. And we will take a look at what that actually looks like here in a second. So definitely come over here to Blue Jupyter and go check out the main repository and go follow MT Taggart. He does Twitch streaming and he's a dyed-in-the-wool educator and he's a good friend of mine, so go ahead and give him a follow. All right, so let's move over to my development workstation and we'll take a look at how we can set up Blue Jupyter and what it can do for us. All right, now I have moved over to my dev workstation. Now this is not in the lab that we have set up for the course. So you can go ahead and install this on any Linux workstation that you happen to have. And so what we'll do is we will git clone the specified branch of the Husky Hacks fork of Blue Jupyter. So go ahead and git clone that branch onto your desktop. And then we can CD into the Blue Jupyter directory right here. Now we're using Poetry as a dependency manager. So if you don't have it already, you'll have to pip3 install Poetry. And so I already have it. So it's going to say requirements already satisfied. So that's good. But install that if you have not done so. And of course, the other thing you're going to need as well is Jupyter Notebooks itself. So Jupyter. And again, I have already installed that, so it's going to say that I have already satisfied the, these requirements. So again, that is pip3 install poetry and pip3 install Jupyter. Now, now that we have cloned the repository, we will do a poetry install, and you have to be in the directory with the poetry lock file. Now again, I have already installed this, but at this point, you're going to install all of the contents of the poetry lock file and the pyproject.toml file. And once that is complete, you're going to drop into a poetry shell. And your shell is going to get super, super funky here. So let's take a look at what the shell looks like. Now, this is effectively, think of this like setting up a virtual environment for Python, but like a total encompassing virtual environment for all of the dependencies that are needed for a given project. So it makes it super easy, super clean to keep track of your dependencies and install them all at the same time and make sure that you're in the context of an environment that you can actually run the project with all of its dependencies. Now, if we do an LS, we have a couple different notebooks 
notebooks here, I'd recommend you go check out the incident response notebook that is by Taggart and it's super cool. Lots of cool stuff that you can do with uh, sysmon logs and crunching them with like uh, NumPy and matplotlib and that kind of stuff, cool visualizations. So go check that out when you get a chance. But today we're going to CD into the malware analysis notebook and we'll do an LS in here. And so that IPYNB is the Jupyter Notebook itself. And we have the Dropbox and the saved specimens directory. And the malware sample.py is kind of the back end for this notebook. So let's see what a Jupyter Notebook actually looks like. Now you have the option to do a Jupyter Notebook. And this will stand up the notebook server and serve it out to you. And all you have to do is click on this right here. And I apologize for the lack of dark mode. If you install Jupyter Lab, which is also in the instructions of this repository, you have the option to do dark mode, uh, but I will stick to the Jupyter Notebook for this time. Now for the automation blue Jupyter module in this course, let's take a look at the scenario. So we'll go over to the PMAT Labs Git repository and take a look at the readme inside of 5.1 automation blue Jupyter. And so we see analyst. I'm really sorry about this, but I have samples to triage and I won't be able to get to them today. There are only a few of them, open parentheses, 26 total LMAO, end parentheses. Can you handle them for me? Thanks, other analyst. Well, thank you so much, other analyst. So uh, it does give the little introduction on how to install this, but we've already done that. So we can go back over to our PMAT labs directory, which I have here on the desktop of my development workstation. We'll go into labs. We go find 5.1 automation blue Jupiter, and we have four triage 7zip. So we're going to open this up, move it out here and open this up and a standard password of infected. All right. So it looks like we've got a whole bunch of executables. Interesting. So we're going to go ahead and move all of these into a special location for the Jupyter Notebook into the Dropbox directory. All right, so we're going to find our blue Jupyter directory. So we'll open this up and we're going to go into the malware analysis directory. And then right in here, we have the Dropbox. Now the Dropbox is going to have two samples in it to start sample positive and sample negative. So we actually don't need these today. These are just for testing and they come packaged with the repository. So we can go ahead and delete those out. But what we will bring in are the samples coming from the four triage directory. And so we can extract these and we'll extract them to blue Jupiter. We go to malware analysis and right into the Dropbox and we will click extract. And let's go ahead and actually move these out so that all of the executables are just right in the main directory right there. And we can get rid of this for triage directory as well. All right, so once again, if you go into the Dropbox, you should now have about 26 of these out.exe samples loaded up into the Dropbox. Now let's go back over to the notebook itself. So we're gonna read a little bit about this malware analysis and triage kit. This notebook performs the initial stages of immediate malware triage. All right, how to take your malware specimen and drop it into the Dropbox directory. Okay, so we've already done that. This notebook will walk you through the stages of initial analysis. At the end of the process, you'll have a triage report in the saved specimens directory. This report includes findings from the initial triage, including defanged specimen in a password protected zip file. Okay, excellent. So this is going to automate a lot of the initial setup stuff that we would have to do with triaging an unknown sample. All right, so how does Jupyter Notebooks work? Well, you see that we've got these markdown cells here that are telling us how to set this up and we've got some headings and stuff. So you can actually write markdown into your Jupyter Notebook so that there's plenty of documentation for somebody who wants to use this uh, to go off of. Now, the other part of Jupyter Notebooks is that in this instance, it acts as a Python REPL, R-E-P-L, a read eval print loop. So you can think of a REPL as a forward facing interactive shell and so a REPL is very similar really to when you do Python 3 in the terminal. When you see this in the terminal, this is a REPL. And so if you do something like import OS, now the OS library is imported into this REPL. So before, if you try to do something like sleep 5, it won't know what to do because the sleep module is not imported from times. But in the context of the REPL, if you from time import sleep, and then you do a sleep five, you will sleep for five seconds. And we'll just quit and we'll get back to the terminal. Okay. So as we go down the cells of this Jupyter notebook, we're actually doing certain Python activities. So we're importing a bunch of stuff. So you can click this run button right up here to start walking through the cells. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is check the Dropbox and save specimens directories and make sure that they exist and they do. 
All right, we'll continue. For the samples in the Dropbox, we're actually going to enumerate them and make sure that we have an idea of all of the samples that are in here, and we'll keep going. And then we're going to instantiate objects, and this basically just makes it so that we have an object for each of the samples in memory to keep track of some of their attributes. So the next thing that we're going to do is create a saved specimen directory for the set of specimens. So for all of the objects that we just instantiated, we're going to actually create a directory and if we go back out of the Dropbox and go into the save specimens directory here, we actually now have a timestamp directory with the original name of the executable in here where we can save all of our following work. Now there's nothing in here yet, but this will be filled up with all of the artifacts that we pull out of the initial triage. All right, next thing we're going to do, like any good analyst, we're going to defang the sample. And that means we're going to append file extension onto the end of each of the samples so that they can't be run with their original file extension unless we rearm them by taking that new extension off. So we're defanging the samples uh, for safety. And then we're going to pull the SHA-256 sums of each of these samples. And we see that we have them printed out right here to the terminal. And so next up, we have one of the really cool parts of this notebook, which is the string analysis. So in the course, I have taught the string utility. I've also taught floss, which is kind of an improvement on strings. But we're actually going to take it up one more level. And we're going to use another tool from the Flare toolbox called String Sifter. And String Sifter will use a machine learning algorithm to examine the entropy of the strings of the samples. And the algorithm will actually assign a score to each of those strings for how likely it is to be malicious. And so the first thing that we need to do is run this cell in which it's asking us for the minimum string length that we want. So four is default and six to eight is recommended. So I'm going to put in eight. Now we click down to this next cell here and we will run this. And so for each of the samples in the Dropbox directory, String Sifter is going to pull the strings out, score them, and save them in the String Sifter out.log file. And so if we go back to our save specimens directory, remember we have all of these working directories now. And if we go into the first one, out0.exe, we can see that the original sample is now here called malware.out0.exe.mals and it's defanged. We have the SHA-256 sum in text form right here and we have the string sifter out.log file. Now let's take a look at string sifter out.log and you see that in the string sifter out.log file, we have the score of the string followed by the string itself. And so the higher scores indicate that it's more likely for these strings to be malicious. And it turns out that this license to Apache Software Foundation is actually common to executables that are packaged and created by MSF Venom. And so we've got some indicators here that this has been packaged by MSF Venom, but you can go take a look at some of the other strings and remember that the strings are ranked by likelihood of being malicious. So in any case, let's go back to the notebook here. Once all of these are written to the out file, we then have the virus total analysis portion. Now you can put in your virus total API key and you're going to need the public API key for this. And so I have provided a cell that will read in your API key as a protected password field. So we can paste in my API key, which you will not be seeing. Uh, and then we go to the next cell where it evaluates if an API key has been posted in or not. Now comes the part where we submit our samples to virus total. And so if you have more than four samples, I have included a sleep interval to make it so that you will not pass the public API rate limit of submissions for these samples. So what we're doing is submitting the SHA-256 sum to the virus total public API and we are getting back a result for that SHA-256 sum. Now, in these samples, one of these samples happens to be very malicious and is flagged by virus total. And so what we do is we submit all of the SHA-256 sums, and we're going to wait for the confidence level and the criticality of that sample. And now this is going to take a while. So when you do this, go ahead and grab yourself a cup of coffee, go take a, take a walk, take a stretch. Uh, and meet me back here when this is done. All right, and we're back. So we take a look at the results of submitting these to virus total, and a whole bunch of them look like they have no results coming back from the SHA-256 sum. But if we look closely, we do in fact have one hit right here. We've got a criticality level of high with a confidence interval of 87.5% that this is a malicious sample. And so we can now triage a little bit more effectively. We can take a look at out19.exe. 
So let's actually go back over to the file directory and we'll go out to find out19.exe for our working directory here, which is right here. And let's take a look at string sifter out.log. And so when we actually take a look at this, this out19.exe is in reality just the icar string inside of an exe. And so that's why it triggers in virus total. And of course, this whole situation is a little bit contrived, but the concept remains the same. So Blue Jupiter can take all of these samples and triage them, submit their SHA-256 sums to virus total, and we did get a hit out of one of these, so then we can take a look at the strings and perform follow-on analysis. The last thing that we have here is that we have zip and password protection on the files, so we'll hit run on that. And if we go back over to our working directory, for each of the samples that now have a stored save specimen directory, we go in and we have a password protected zip file with the sample inside of it. And so if we try to bring this out to the folder out here, we have to put in a standard password of infected. And there we go. All right, everybody. So that was an introduction to Blue Jupiter and the malware analysis and triage kit. Now, at the time of recording this, this is still very much a seedling project and I have lots of ideas of what I want to implement in this. Now, some of the things I want to implement this are more robust reporting. Uh, I would like to interface with Malware Bazaar to pull down samples, lots of different ideas. But the this just kind of goes to show you that you can take something like Jupyter Notebooks and you can make a whole workflow, a whole pipeline out of your particular method of initial triage. And you can write this so that it will assist you in the automation efforts for your malware analysis and triage. So I hope you enjoyed that. Go check out Jupyter Notebooks. A huge thank you to my good friend, Michael Taggart, for this one. He came up with the idea and uh, I just took the malware notebook and ran with it, but he is the brains behind the operation in the first place. He taught me a whole lot about Jupyter Notebooks. He taught me a whole lot about structuring Python to be object oriented. So thank you to my good friend, MT Taggart, for that. And so that's the video for today, guys. Thank you very much. And I will 